um do hang around bees lovely if you want to follow him on twitter it's uh have you got your twitter handle there you can just quickly pop up as a slide uh, so uh, I don't have mentioned my Twitter handler this time. That's that's fine. <laughs> uh, not a problem. Do do hang about if you want to ask B any questions. I, I guess yeah. shoot them in the Slack or something, and uh, I can fire them over time and get you a, an answer. But he's lovely. Thank you so yeah. much, B. I think we're yeah. going to move to antagonistics now. But B, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, cheers, everyone. Have a nice day ahead. And again. Uh, if you have any question, uh, be it a positive or negative, in a negative perspective, I'm always open to answer that. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Excellent. Year. Thanks, man. Yeah, I think we're meant to be moving to antagonistics now. We're now hopefully in the right chat room, yes? We're briefly in the wrong chat room. Sorry about that. Um, if I put my video on, and um, do do. Hopefully you can see me. I'm not great with technical stuff, but we're ready to go whenever you are. But yeah, so I'll start talking and if you just want to shout at me when you're bored and you want to carry on with the exciting coding stuff and all the rest of it, then. Right, okay, fair enough. So do we want to start now or later? <laughs> Absolutely. Do you want to introduce yourselves just quickly? We'll do. Um, right, we'll just start. And as I said, just, just kick us off uh, at some point if you get bored. So anyway, um, nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Duncan. Um, sorry, I'm just going to bounce up so I can actually see us on our own screen here, hopefully. Oh, uh, why does Zoom never... There we go, that's what I want. Just so I can see what I'm doing. Right, hello. Um, as I said, my name is Duncan McNulty. I uh, have the great pleasure of being the chief advisor here at Bath, which is the Bartetsu and Antagonistics Forum, which is a mouthful that probably doesn't mean a lot to many people. Bartetsu is uh, a Victorian mixed martial art. I'm not going to talk about that now because I think we'll be talking about that to you in the afternoon if you're around for the afternoon section. Um, today, we're gonna, this morning, we're going to talk about antagonistics, which is really just other ways of envisaging violence on people, in particular swords. That's what we're interested in here. So what we're going to do now for the next kind of half hour is take you on a very brief history of dueling. Um, and the plan is that we're going to take you from very early medieval right the way through, I think, until about Victorian period with how people handle dueling um, and introduce you to some swords with some demonstrations along the way. Um, I'm joined this morning by Andrew Walton and uh, Michael Whitsker, who are uh, also members of the forum here, who are going to be helping me out because it's very hard to show you how to do sword fighting on your own. Um, so yes, let's start off when we're talking about dueling. Um, this is where two people are trying to settle an argument and decide to use force to do it. Now, the first recorded instance we have of this, now obviously people will have been settling scores with fights for a long time, but the first recorded instance what we have of somebody codifying a system for doing this is actually um, Talhofer, who is a kind of early medieval um, uh, duelist and uh, weapon master who's selling his services all around Europe. And actually, it relates to probably the most extreme form of uh, dueling in that it covers divorce settlements. Now, in good Catholic countries, you can't divorce. Um, so what they decided was to get around this, they would really emphasize on that till death do we part. So the idea was the man and the woman, if they had no other recourse, would fight each other to the death. Uh, and whoever was alive was then no longer married and therefore had effectively divorced and could go off and do whatever they wanted. Now, um, they decided that actually a man versus woman fight would be unfair. So they decided to create all of these rules to try and level the playing field between the man and the woman in order to fight. Now, sadly, none of our girls were able to make it today. So which one of you being a girl? You're being a girl. Great, fantastic. Andy, Andy and Michael sadly aren't getting on very well, uh, having a few disputes and have decided to separate. So um, the first thing they did is they, um, they would take the man who is, who is taller, um, and therefore that is the first thing that is unfair. So they dug a pit 
and buried him up to his waist in a pit. Yeah, okay, we, we can't dig a hole in the Prohibition floor. They'd get very upset with us. I should say, yeah, the lovely backdrop, we're actually in the Prohibition bar in Newcastle at the minute, which is a lovely, a lovely venue for us today. Um, so, yes, they put the man in a pit and they've given him a nice short club that he's going to use to attempt to bludgeon his wife, um, drag her into the pit and strangle her if he possibly can. Now, it's the other side, you have the woman who is free to move around, but they also decided that women weren't trained in the ways of war, so couldn't really use a weapon. So what they give her is essentially a half brick in a sock. Um, so she's got this swinging, wildly uncontrollable item that she's going to use. Now, the problem is, I'll just let that, I'll keep talking whilst they try and kill each other, um, is that the man can't shuffle along the floor like that. Um, the woman's weapon is very difficult to parry because if he blocks that, it just wraps around and hits him anyway because it's on a flexible piece of string. And uh, the, the man also has, has the disadvantage that the attacks are coming in from above and he's trying to actually get him hit in and drag her down into the pit and she's trying to stay out of the way. And so they continue to bludgeon each other until either the woman manages to crack him across the head with a solid blow, he's not doing very well today, uh, and, and crack his head in, um, or she gets dragged down into the pit and gets strangled. You guys are being very tame with this today. I've seen you do that. <laughs> right, okay. We'll, 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 oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. We'll, we'll, we'll call you divorced. It's okay. You don't have to go home together. Uh, so we have this first way of actually fighting. Very odd setup, but this is the first recorded we have of it of settling this disagreement. Now, moving on from there, things start to get a little bit different as we start heading through uh, the medieval period, um, and we start really introducing much more interesting weapons. So, for example, hand and a half sword, we're actually now into a, a kind of period of time where we can actually start doing proper damage to each other, and we now start to look at predominantly well-trained fighting men settling their disagreements with 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 um with swords um and at this point we really get uh, the concept of might makes right now the idea with this is if you have a legal dispute with someone you can choose combat by arms god will clearly favor whoever is right and therefore they'll win and that's how it works so it isn't being better that makes you able to survive the duel it's being right and having god on your side at least that's the theory um, so you end up using these kind of swords and these big kind of fights. To be honest, it's not a period we study a lot. It's not a particularly interesting period from my point of view. So we're not going to talk about it a lot. But what I will do is you take this opportunity to introduce you a little bit to what we're talking about in terms of swords. Um, so in a sword, we have a grip and the pummel. Um, really, this is a heavy weight to balance the weapon. You also use it occasionally for smacking people in the face. You've got your cross guard which stops anything coming in and hitting your hand when you're using the sword, and then you have the blade. Okay, that's the important bits you need to know about the sword that we'll be talking about as we're going through. Um, so yeah, we have the kind of hand-and-a-half sword, big kind of nice sweeping motions, big dramatic lunges, um, but we're not going to talk a lot about that, but that is where we start. We go through this period of might makes right. Where things start getting more interesting, at least from my point of view, is from that kind of uh, Middle East, uh, medieval times, we really split into three separate categories of dueling for the next couple of hundred years. And the first of them is in the military. Um, I'm just going to put a glove on because I'm going to be... Oh, is there a second saver somewhere? Is... Sorry, I was... <laughs> Cheers, thank you. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at is the military. Now, the military, um, very much in favour of cutting implements. And they're not so much for the stabbing. They like to cause big open wounds that stop people. So um, here we have a um, saber, very traditional kind of weapon, be used as a, a side weapon for people using muskets, even right towards the end of the dueling period. Um, you've got a slightly curved blade, which means that you actually put more power into your strikes and a more guarded hand. So the idea of this one is, if I can get uh, Andy across here as an opponent, is you have your your guard, and this would be officers trying to settle a duel. Most of, so it could even be on the same side, but often it was between um, armies, they would agree that the officers would duel. And this is all about honor, really. This isn't about trying to kill him, this is about trying to disarm him or draw blood so that I can say I've won. Now we're both 
officers that were also probably both relatively high born and we don't want to actually kill each other because you know that's what the peasantry is for we send waves and waves of them to die we want to stay alive so everything we're doing at the minute is based around trying to get a nice simple hit so we start off and one person will do an attack and the other person will happily parry and then reply with an attack and that is really how the fight starts to build up going backwards and forwards until somebody makes a mistake probably me because i'm talking <laughs> there we go so yeah so if an attack will get through now that is how it goes and you get this kind of back and forward of combat going on and this this happens in this space between us now of course that's fine but somebody eventually has to win and the way to ensure that it's not just with the mistake is to find ways of cheating ways of confusing my opponent or getting past him and that's really where it starts to get interesting now, when we look at Sabre, um, the predominant ones we've got is something called a beat. So the first thing we're going to do is physically batter his sword out of the way. So in order to do this, I'm going to start with an attack to his sword. Now, the back third of a Sabre is shot. So what I can do then is bring that up and through his head. Which is probably not enough to kill him, enough to disable him whilst I come in with a larger hit. Um, we also have the glissade, which works quite well, which is to actually slice down my opponent's blade to move it offline. Very much the same kind of attack. You bring it back in again. I can go here, glissade, have my attack going through. Um, also, I can look to, to do sneaky things like getting in a bit closer, so an attack coming in. I might decide to parry, get in closer, and then use the butt of my, my sword to smash him in the face. Um, so that's really kind of how this works. But ideally, I'm not looking for a big solid hit that's going to kill him. What I want to do ideally is, especially if you're against somebody with a bad guard, is wrap, that's it, I'm correct, it, wrap that over the top and just court, score a cut on the arm. Tiny little movement here. So what I'm likely to do is come in with an attack and then look to cut over to the other side and just get a cut across his wrist. And that's me one because I, I, I've caused damage. And that's kind of saber. Do you guys want to have a, a quick bash with sabers? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you've got a mask on, I'll let. Uh, I'm conscious of time. We might have to go a little quicker and skip some stuff. But, <laughs> but yeah, come at each other very quickly. Just be careful of the light. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's fine. Great. Yeah, Chris. As I said, we'll be trying, trying to. Put in as much information as well as showing you some of what it is we're actually doing as well. But from there, other than the military, um, we also have the civilian. Now, the civilians much prefer stabbing weapons. Now, the reason for that is when you stab somebody, you definitely kill them um, without uh, <clears throat> being uh, too, what's the word I'm looking for, <laughs> euphemistic at this time of the morning. It only takes two fingers of penetration to kill somebody. If I can get a blade, two fingers worth into somebody's chest and hitting internal organs. So whether that's the heart, the lungs, something that's going to cause permanent damage. So if I can run somebody through, they're dead, I have won, that is a great way of dealing with it. The problem is they won't die instantly. They can probably carry on for a little while whilst they bleed out or stop breathing, which means that's great in a situation where I kill, I step back, there's people around, there were rules, that's all done. But not so great on a battlefield when I stab him, he pulls himself up the sword and smashes my head in and we both die. So military much prefer a trauma weapon. If I slice somebody's chest open, they might live from it, but they're probably not going to carry on fighting. Civilians prefer something much more deadly, but uh, less able to actually have stopping power. Um, do you want to get yeah, whoever's doing rapier? So, um, so the idea of, of the rapier, and this is what we're getting to your three musketeers rather than, I suppose, Sabre, you want to think more your shops, crusades, if anybody's a fan of the Bernard Cromwell. I'm not great with my office. Um, but uh, yeah, when we're looking at rapier, we've moved much more to a point-orientated weapon. So what I'm looking to do is catch my opponent's blade, move it offline, and then find a line that my, my weapon can get in in reply. And um, the idea is we're both fighting for this middle line. Um, if I do nothing and just walk forward, before I reach him, he will stab me because he has the middle line. If I can take the middle line, so now my blade's on the middle line and his has been moved off slightly, if I just walk forward now, I'm safe and he's dead. So, again, we have the same situation where one person will attack, 
the other person will parry, come back with their own attack, and the whole thing starts, uh, sorry, enveloped there, that was cheating for this early in the tournament. Um, so we just get that kind of back and forth going again, where the blades are moving around. And you'll notice there's much less clanging, much more rasping metal as we're fighting for control over that middle line. The great thing that makes this different is the lunge. It means that I can quite happily be out of distance of him and put in this long lunge where I can quite happily run him through and recover. It was really the invention of that technique that allows point oriented things to, to come forward. Now we still have, if we want to use it, we still got a beat, we still got a glissade, but now we start having more fun things like disengages. So this time I can go to stab him on one line as he goes to parry, I dip my point underneath, up to the other side, and continue that attack, completely missing his blade altogether. Oh, sorry, that was your arm. So that I can come underneath his blade and attack quite happily. So we have disengages, we have beats, we have all of these things. I can start building them together. So I can beat, wait for him to overreact on his parry, then disengage, and then kill him. Um, so all of these tricks start to build up. We also have envelops, where if he comes in for an attack and I parry, I might decide instead of wanting it here, I want his blade over this side and then continue. Um, so we have all of these kind of things. We also have the opportunity, I'm going to switch around for visibility. We can also start looking at things like disarms, which are kind of fun. So if I've got an attack coming in, I can look to block that attack, step in, and take my opponent's pummel. From there, I can actually just use my own hips to push him out of the way and take his weapon off him. It's very flashy. Um, the other, my other favorite flashy one, um, just to love it on this side again, that's fine. So if I take it here, this time I grab it, but step the other way. Rather than controlling him as turning this way, I pull him back this way and bring my blade up, controlling his sword out of the way, stabbing him through the face, which is very pretty. Um, the other great thing about, uh, uh, about regular is it brings in the offhand weaponry. So now we can start looking at using two weapons at the same time. So now I have an offhand dagger from main gosh and my sword. This allows me, if an attack comes in, to decide how I want to deal with it. I can parry it with my dagger, so simultaneously I can be attacking with the rapier. I can parry with the sword, and then do my attack with the dagger. I also have options if he's coming in with like giant overhead swings, if he's a, a more of a brutal kind, I can use a double parry and then come off that double parry looking to attack here. I can also do really nice convoluted things, like when the attack comes in, I can take that. Sorry, yeah, just do a straight lunge, sorry. Straight lunge? Yeah, yeah. So I can do a parry down here, envelop as we talked about before, pass it off to the dagger, bind with the dagger, and then continue through with my, my lunge. To give you an idea of the speed that that actually goes at, Yeah, and he's run through quite happily. So we have the dagger, quite a nice offhand weapon. We also have buckler. Cheers. I was grabbing off Andy. So this time it's a small shield. Now I'm not going to hide behind this as I would do like a, a, a medieval shield. Instead, I'm either going to push that. You'll notice the more I push it forward, the more of me is hidden behind it. And then it becomes about angles. So if I hold it here, he can't hit my head. He can go over the top of it, but he can't actually hit my head. So I'm using the fact that there's angles there. I'm also going to hold it slightly sideways and use this edge here to parry. So when he comes in with an attack, I'm actually going to punch into it and parry, and that allows me to deliver my attack in the same time. Yeah? The other thing is we have a very exposed hand position. I mean, there is a guard over the top of there, but it's very easy if my guard goes low, for the back of my hand to become accessible to a little cut. And as I said, all you've got to do to cut, um, to win the fight is to cut. So what I might do is as an attack comes in, is I might decide to cover my hand with, my, with the, uh, the shield so that I'm actually covered. I can then punch that away and come through with my attack, which actually that would have been really through you, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So before before you kebab someone or live on stream, um, I just uh, we are going to have to move on to another speaker. But you guys are going to come back and do some pretty impressive stuff, I believe. 
We're going to carry on doing stuff for you. Yeah, we'll, we'll be back later on this afternoon. I'm aware that time's a bit short, so obviously moving on. Um, we'll be looking at doing more kind of punching and kicking and grappling and kind of close, unarmed work this afternoon. All right, uh, do you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm signed up for that. Love it. <laughs> we'll be back love doing it. that one, yeah. I absolutely love it. Listen, thanks, guys. That was that was awesome. Um, I did laugh a lot because you're just kicking the shit out of each other, and I love that. I think that's <laughs> grand. Um, that's what we're here for. We're, we're here to to take all the bruises and entertain you. It's not a B-side unless someone gets the shit kicked out of them, consensually. Um, yeah, but not, yeah, yes, yeah, I'm safe saying consensual. It's important, yes. Exactly. Um, and that was that was pretty cool. Um, I absolutely loved it. Uh, that's my day made. Uh, so they, you get you well, we'll be back later on, and and we'll be kind of strangling each other and throwing each other for your entertainment as well. So yeah, yeah. Four fifteen p.m. If anybody just wants to just chime in for the Bartitsu, absolutely yeah, we'll worthwhile. Back. Yeah, we'll be back to do another session for you. Yeah, grand. Listen, thanks very much. Good day. Um, it, you know, it's, it's been great being part of this. Great. <laughs> thanks, man. Bartitsu dudes, I'm doing some more Bartitsu. If I can make my camera work and everything, hopefully. <laughs> Hello. This is the best. Um, slight costume change from this morning. Um, and uh, yes, for the next little while, we will be beating each other up for your entertainment. So please do, um, again, when you, you get bored of our blood and violence, um, feel free to call us into a halt. Um, but again, my name's Duncan. Um, I'm the Chief Instructor at the Bartitsu and Antagonistics Forum. And I have Andrew Walton and Michael Woods here with me today giving me a hand. Um, in fact, they're going to be doing all the hard work and I'm just going to be talking for this section which is lovely. So the Bartitsu that we do, the Bartitsu part of it, is a Victorian mixed martial art. The very quick history of it is a gentleman called Barton Wright uh, was an engineer, goes out to Japan to work on the railroads, and whilst he's out there, he learns jiu-jitsu, one of the first Westerners to learn jiu-jitsu. So when he comes back to London, he brings a couple of jiu-jitsu people with him. Um, he adds in pugilism, so bare-knuckle boxing, um, French kickboxing, savate, um, adds in some... Uh, cane fighting that comes from a kind of French Swiss guy, um, amalgamates all this together, sticks his name on it, makes it an itsu at the end so that it sounds Japanese and sells well, and that's how you get bar titsu. Um, so what I'm going to do is very really quickly take a rundown of each of the components so you can get an idea of what it is we actually do. So I think in the background you can see the two of them already starting to line up with a bit of fighting. Um, so this is pugilism largely. You'll notice rather than the modern day boxing guard, their hands are much more extended out in front of them. The reason for that is if you're not wearing boxing gloves and somebody punches you in the arm, you punch yourself in the face. So the hands stay nice and far away from your head. And you'll notice that a lot of the time, they'll just be looking to move that hand aside as it comes in and look to reply with an attack of their own. Now, it doesn't look like you'd have a lot of power in that just simple extension and attack. We have something called a drop step. So if you want to do a drop step, for instance, that's just so you can see the difference. So the idea is rather than, than power coming from the arm, we're actually going to lift a foot and drop down into it. So actually all of that power is being generated by full body weight. So, <laughs> yeah, you're not going to do it with a hat, <laughs> So rather than just a little tap, it comes in with a lot more power. Um, so you're able to do much, quite strong hits. And the idea would be we keep people at guard and then you smash them in the nose when they get close enough to do that. So right, guys, if you want to drop that down and carry on. Um, now, the, the other advantages to, to pugilism is you don't want to just stand there and trade blows with the other guy because then it comes down to who can take the most hits. Ideally, what we want to do is block and reply, or ideally not be there at all in the first place. So we use a technique called slipping, where we'll move out of the way and actually apply an attack in the same time without actually parrying anything, which allows us to, to get in and get very quick attack coming in. Um, are you doing all right for slipping yet? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the pugilism works a lot of that. We also do a lot of stuff with our elbows as well, because um, it, it, it's... We're not confined by the rules of modern day boxing. So there's nothing to stop us using the elbow. So one of the techniques we'll use will be when a fist comes in, you'll catch it and actually drag your elbow up through the other person's hand. Because if you can break their hand, they're not going to keep punching you with it. Um, and that opens them up for, for counterattacks as well. So you get a lot of elbow techniques coming in. We also have something called dirty boxing, which is totally banned in, in modern day boxing. 
But if they get too close, they'll move from this kind of boxing into a full-on clinch. And once you're in these kind of techniques, um, this is all considered part of boxing. So they will be punching each other in the face, trying to escape, pulling away, um, grabbing each other, hitting each other in the kidneys, and all kinds of stuff that's totally not allowed in modern-day boxing. Um, but perfectly acceptable in bare knuckle boxing, which is what we're doing here. Now, as well as this, we're also bringing in French savate. So we're looking at kickboxing, um, which suddenly gets, you'll suddenly see kicks starting to develop here. Now, we don't tend to do high, big kicks, as you see in something um, like Taekwondo or something, simply because those become very easy to grab. And once you've got hold of somebody's leg up here, you can do horrible, horrible things to them whilst they bounce around on the other leg. So most of the kicks tend to be below the waist. Um, if we're going to hit them above the waist, we'll use our fists. Um, and realistically, we've never needed to kick higher than, uh, let's call it the, the, the family area. Um, if you can land a solid blow there with a kick, the fight is probably over. So a lot of the kicks are used to hold their opponent at bay. So when somebody's coming in, they'll use a kick to stop them getting in close. So it's used a lot to control range. It's also used a lot of the time um, to come in with uh, attacks to the knees. Um, trying to break the other person's stance so you can then throw them when you move into grappling. Um, particularly, the French love things in threes, so one standard attack is to attack the front knee, jump through, attack the back knee, and then the third attack comes up between the legs to the fork, um, and the opponent drops down pretty quickly. Um, that combines very nicely with the pugilism, obviously, because you use your hands for the top line, using your legs for the bottom line, and you can attack on both lines kind of simultaneously. So the third part we then go into is jujitsu. So this is more what we're looking at throws and things. So this works a lot with somebody grabbing somebody, um, and then you would be looking at a kind of bit of what you guys are in the background. So if, if you're looking at, um, there you are, let's do this up close. So we can show some of these techniques. Somebody, no, no, somebody grab my shirt. Grab my shirt there, there we go. So what we're looking for is when somebody grabs you, you can do very simple techniques where you take hold of weak jointed areas, and it's all about then exploiting the mechanics of the human body. From here, and I push, the arm locks, the shoulder locks, and I have complete control over the body. Um, likewise, if I go the other way, rather than going for the little finger, I can exploit the thumb. It's quite a weak actual joint in here, and this time everything wraps up, but I've still got control of my opponent. We also have situations where um, I may not actually want to hurt somebody. This is the drunk uncle at a party. It's called escorting a gentleman out of the room. But if I can get the arm, rather than doing anything painful, I can loop it over and hyperextend it across here. From now on, he will go where I tell him to go. And I can quite happily escort him out of the room um, without actually causing any further fuss or without causing any damage to him. Which is all very nice, but realistically, if we're using it in a fight, um, it, it, we, we need to do something a bit more dramatic than just these little manipulations of hands. So we go to bigger things such as, uh, do you guys want to work on some takedowns? Do you want to do that? So what we'll be looking at here is um, where you're taking away somebody's stance and letting them fall in behind them. So you'll notice he's going through, taking the leg out, and down Andy goes to the floor. Now you can do these relatively dramatically. We think of them in two terms. We have takedowns where you're just making somebody fall over. You're not really trying to hurt them. This is about controlling somebody. Uh, the other option is to throw them, and we're not going to do that because it's a concrete floor here, and that's really bad for everybody involved. Um, but you can do throws where you literally pick people up and drop them, and that's much more violent, and, and we're actually using the floor essentially as an improvised weapon. Okay, yeah, we're there fairly hard there. So that's where the jujitsu component comes in. So what we've now got is a system where we can use our hands, we can use our feet, um, for kickboxing, and then if they're getting too close, we're going to switch instantly to the jujitsu, which ties in nicely with boxing. We can get into the dirty boxing, and from that, bring in our jujitsu and start doing our tricks. Now, of course, if somebody is further away than um, fist and hand range, we start looking at improvised weaponry. Now, the primary one we use is a walking stick. Do you guys have pains? Yeah. You did. Okay, so we have pains. And um, grab one as well. So, a walking stick, the first thing to realize when you're trying to use a walking stick as a weapon is that it isn't a sword. There's nothing protecting my hand. So if I parry things like a sword, things slide down and damage my hand. So everything's done from a very high guard across the top. Let's be very careful about that line of So a lot of it is swinging attacks here. If you guys just want to go for it. So they'll be parrying across and then coming in with attacks that go over the top. So you're going to see a lot of these 
kind of tip-top motion. Um, also, the important thing is if it's not a sword, we don't have an edge, which means I can hit with the back of it, the side of it, whenever needed. So one option is I can swing over at the top and where it would normally be parried, I can actually swing over the top and strike down quite low with the end of it, but my hand is very high above their parry. And if they've come everything goes above, trying to stop me hitting them in the head, my next attack goes low between the legs with, with a reply. So um, we've got these kind of attacks. You've also got things like if you've got a hook on the end, um, you're able to use that to entangle your opponent's leg. So what you're looking for is a parry. They'll take a parry, um, grab the hand, and then use the hook to actually catch behind the leg and pull them off balance. Um, and once they're down there, you can then bludgeon them quite happily at your own leisure. Um, so there's those kind of different tactics you've got with cane that you can use with the hooks as well. Now, one of the things that, that people don't know about Gartipsu, well, other than like everything, because nobody's ever heard of it, but one of the things is it was heavily involved in the uh, suffragette movement. Um, a lot of women were getting arrested, so there was a group called Packer's Bodyguards who were actually trained in Bartitsu to protect the suffragettes. Now, they didn't tend to use walking sticks. What they tended to use was an umbrella. If you want to grab the umbrella. Um, now, you probably don't need to pay for this bit. Um, now, the umbrella is a useful weapon for slapping somebody with um, because it's got lots of nice spongy bits in. However, it has a metal rod right the way down the middle with a, with, with a spike. So if you use it a bit more like a set bayonet, you can stab somebody with it quite effectively. Now, you can actually use this if... Sorry, okay. If, if, if uh, somebody was to attack, you can use it to defend. And then this opens up the underarm or the, the, the armpit, which can then be used to strike into, um, numbing the whole arm. If somebody does that too often and they still haven't got the message, the other option is to take that aim a little bit lower between the legs, at which point they will very much get the message. So you're able to use things like an umbrella as well as a relatively good self-defense technique. Even against something like a grab, if uh, uh, if you do a double grab, then uh, just step back, take a couple of steps back so you're actually on screen. <laughs> so if uh, Michael does a double grab, you can see Andrew's able to put the umbrella up between the arms and actually twist the attacker off him before he then delivers his own attack. So using things like that as well. And um, we also have the option for what we call incidental weapons. If you want to borrow my hat or sleep, you want to throw things around. Certainly. Um, when somebody is actually uh, preparing to do an attack, we can use whatever we have at hand. If we can't use it as an improvised weapon, we'll use it as a distraction technique. So was Andrew to try an attack, uh, Michael's able to essentially lob his hat at him. So whilst he is trying to recover, because if something comes at your face, you automatically block it, and can then pummel him quite happily, close the ground, and take the initiative. A huge thing about Bartitsu is what they call trying to disturb my opponent's equilibrium without them disturbing mine, which means taking the initiative, getting in, and performing the attacks like you guys are doing in the background. How much time have I got left? I'm just, I'm, I'm rushing through stuff today. Oh, is there anybody on the other end? I don't have a... Uh, we have a keynote at 16.45, so you've got about 10 minutes to continue kicking the crap out of one another. Yeah, I'm loving this. I know some... Right, so, um, oh, <laughs> losing buttons. Losing buttons, that's always a good sign. So, we're able to then start combining some of these things together. Do you guys want to um, go into a bit more of the sparring? Just yeah, show some of the kind of techniques. Um, all right, you, yeah, okay, go, okay, Kane. That sounds good. Um, so, we're able to use a lot of these techniques in combination. So, what you'll find is, and uh, I suspect will happen here, they'll start off very much like the. Uh, <laughs> um, they'll start off at what we call extended range. So this is um, cane distance. They can't actually hit each other in kickboxing. They're going to be looking to land blows with the cane. Now, however, should that in such a time get too close, they can quite happily switch to punches and kicks um, as they go. You can go a bit harder than that, guys. It's all right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they might be looking, in this case, I suspect, Michael will be looking to keep the distance because he's taller, whilst I suspect Andrew's trying to close in and take this to a, uh, a closer range. So instantly we've gone from kicking, where if we're getting in closer, it'll instantly go to grappling as well. And um, so the real power is to be able to switch 
from one particular part of the art to another. As you see, we're now into grappling um, and dirty boxing. They're fighting for position to see who can get one of them on the ground. We'll hold it there. I'm not going to go into groundwork today. Uh, but you can see them taking, adapting to the situation. So you use whatever you have at hand to start with, um, whether that's a handful of pocket change lobbed in somebody's face so you can get the clothes in. Um, if they're getting closer, you can switch instantly. You've got your boxing, you've got your elbows, knees, you've got your feet. You can use all of these. And if it gets closer, and again, you're into your grappling, you're looking for position, you're throwing people, kicking people over the shoulder, all of these kind of techniques that we've got as well. Um, I would say one thing just to finish off then, since one of the things we actually teach is very much focused on um, self-defense. Um, and this is one of the things people ask me most often is the what if you are mugged by somebody with a knife? What's the cool move that disarms this situation? What is your, and this is one of the things that I say to everybody who comes and drinks with me, whatever you have in your wallet is probably not worth risking your life for. If I check in my wallet now, I've got a fiver, some credit cards, a picture of my daughter. None of this is stuff that I'm gonna laugh, worry about too much. So. The thing is, if somebody asks me for my wallet or they're going to stab me, yeah, they've got a straight razor because people carry those these days. I will give them my wallet. That is the best self-defense in this situation. The trick is how you give it to them. Because the thing is, if I hand him this, he's now got it and I'm still standing really close to him. What I want to do is create, again, a moment where I'm in control of the situation. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to give him my wallet. Now, he's got a decision. Does he want my wallet or does he want me? Whilst he's picking up my wallet, I'm this way. And I'm trying to find my, my, my way to somewhere that's populated or whatever. So a lot of people are looking for very funky ways of taking down people that are heavily armed. But a lot of self-defense is about situational awareness and de-escalating the situation and getting out of there alive. That is a win. So take, whilst we do teach just in case, you know, techniques for if somebody comes with a knife where you start kind of looking for those kind of wraps, bring them in and control the hand and the weapon very close. Although that seems very counterintuitive that I'm almost putting the, the knife to my neck. From here, I have all of the power because he's close in. And then I can just twist until I take control of the situation. Um, but normally, if you can, get out of the situation. And that's, that's always my advice when it comes to self-defense types of things. But anyway, Bartitsu was a big thing in Victorian England. Um, and then it kind of disappeared for about 50 years and nobody heard of it um, until there were references to it in, um, uh, I almost said Shakespeare. Sorry, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, completely wrong thing. One of his books, The, the um, uh, Case of the Empty House, Sherlock Holmes makes his grand return. Um, and he has to explain how he survived his big fight with Moriarty at the Rackenbach Falls. Um, and he says, I, I knew Baritsu. Um, and then people started asking, what is this thing? And suddenly through this, over the last kind of 30 years, people have recreated what Bartitsu is. So we're now carrying that on, teaching some of those techniques as a self-defense system and continuing that project on of going, what works? How do we actually make techniques work? So a lot of what we do is actually learning a technique and then trying to make it work. There's no point knowing a flowery technique if it doesn't do anything. So we tend to be much more get in there, get scrappy, throw people around, because that's how you know things actually work. So hopefully that's, that's been some level of entertainment. We're happy to answer any questions or anything if anybody's got any. Um, or we're happy just to have whatever time's left. These two will lock up out of each other for your entertainment if you want. I'm not hearing anything, so you guys just want to punch each other until we're time's up. It's all good. <laughs> see again they're very much trying to keep each other at range to find the range that works for them there's a lot of these kind of kicks that are going low and then not actually landing where they're just trying to control the distance um, and then a lot of what you're seeing is these single punches landing um, and then that's giving somebody the, the advantage and they're just piling on with that with everything they've got after that 
Um, you can see them both getting a bit knackered after I've made them fight for this one, but it's quite fun. <laughs> So yeah, that's really what we do. We train um, every week. We train in doing Bartitsu and we train in antagonistics. For those of you who were here this morning, um, we split our time roughly equally between uh, unarmed stuff. The unarmed stuff we're doing a bit less of at the minute due to COVID. A bit hard to do grappling and maintain social distancing. A bit easier if you've got a couple of swords between you. Um, but yes, hopefully we've given you some idea of what we do. You've provided some entertainment with bludgeoning. And uh, yeah, I think you're about to head on to a keynote speak at this point if i'm right yeah yeah absolutely we've got um rumor dankted is going to be up soon yeah yeah, yeah let's round of applause for these guys <laughs> i absolutely <laughs> loved it i even went and got my top hat i tried to find a cane no one in the house is willing to get the shit kicked out of them so that's unfortunate <laughs> yeah uh, we're, we're, well yeah so we're, we're always we're always willing to to help out wherever we can we do have study groups around the uk there are other people doing bartitsu as well um, but yes, we, we, we are in Newcastle every week. We we meet up in Prohibition upstairs and and, and knock lumps out of each other. 